secret she's been keeping from you. What secret? The one she don't want Phil Mitchell telling you about. Will Phil do the dirty? Oh, I'm gonna ask you once. Stay away from her. Oh what? Will Steve discover the truth? He's having an attack of the jitters, that's all. I know who you are! EastEnders, next week on BBC One. Everyone's talking about it. Lining up the big stars for a Saturday night on BBC One. Thank you. On tonight's show, two Hollywood superstars. One is a Hollywood legend, he is Kirk Douglas. The other is a woman who plays a perfectionally dizzy blonde, but is also a shrewd, successful Hollywood player, and she is Goldie Horn. Also tonight, a song from the wonderful Shardy. But first, one of my favorite guests, a true all-rounder, a television favorite, a writer of style, a poet, a man who can dance a tango while dashing off a lyric for a song. Had he gone into movies, they would never have heard of Russell Crowe. Ladies and gentlemen, Clive James. <laughs> Look at you, sylph-like. Wasting away, it's my new diet. It's called the Montignac diet. Uh -huh. Invented by a guy called Montignac. And he teaches that you separate the carbohydrates and the proteins. Uh -huh. And I've been doing it, and it works. Oh, how much have you lost? How many pounds? Oh, thousands of pounds. <laughs> <laughs> it's a very expensive diet. But you separate the carbohydrates and the proteins. You put the carbohydrates in one room, the proteins in another, <laughs> and you get your exercise by running between them. <laughs> and the result is what you see. I look more and more like Russell Crowe every day. You do. There's a remarkable similarity. Well, there always has been. There has know. been. We, we both have a very round head and two tiny eyes touching each other. Right? <laughs> But women love this guy. I know. Just... It's interesting, isn't it? We've gone through all this sort of feminist stuff about touchy-feely guys and sensitive men. And all of a sudden, this guy comes in a leather skirt. Leather skirt and sandals and the, wind, the wind blowing up his hairy legs. <laughs> yeah. And they adore him. They think he's a dinkum Aussie. In fact, he's a New Zealander. But, yes, he is. But the Aussies say that he's an Aussie because we want to adopt him. You, you, know, you, you claim him. Because the women just go crazy for this guy. It's, it's, it's kind of disappointing, isn't it, really? Because we've spent years now, you and I, our generation, listening to the feminists and becoming more and more tender and, and concerned and treating women decently. And now it turns out they want to be thrown to the ground by a brute like me. <laughs> I suppose what we have to do is try and balance the th two things and throw the women to the ground decently. decently yes. yeah. but, but it's that, it raises that, that old question, that wonderful, deep question, one of the world's great questions, what do, do women want? I think Freud died saying that. Yeah. Did he? <laughs> <laughs> he, died, he died saying it in German too, which is quite a great. <laughs> And he never, and if he did, didn't know, who does know? But no, no we, we, don't, we don't know what they want. We have to ask them. And of course, they, they might not be telling us the truth. It turns out they haven't been. But uh, they, they, they want you to, to be concerned and tender, but to assert yourself. And these yes. two things are very difficult to do. What you have to do is be like Russell Crowe. You grab them behind the head by the hair. And you bend them down and you say, I'm not taking no for an answer. Tonight, I'm doing the washing up. <laughs> Hmm? That's the way we, to might, do it. we might ask Goldie home as she comes on. Yeah, well, I, we can try that on her. We Goldie, could, that'd be nice. I'm not yeah. taking no for an answer. But the, the, I mean, the thing about Russell Crowe, I mean, that's really an extension, isn't it, of your child? It probably is an extension, actually. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and my you mean that sword he's holding? That's yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And my childhood too, <laughs> just because of that, that influence that, that on our generation that, that movies had. Yeah, I think probably young young guys are coming out of the cinema now and and uh, and sort of looking for animals to fight and the way that. Uh, when we were very young, we came out of the cinema imi imitating the stars. Like, uh, Kirk Douglas is on tonight, which is a great moment for you and I, I know. Yes, I, saw I'm, I was there when the first movie, Champion, came out in oh, Australia. wonderful movie. And the intensity of the man on screen, the intensity. And I became intense. I was only 11 years old, but I became very, very intense. Yeah. I, and anything I said, I was intense. May I sit down? You know? <laughs> and, and that dimple in his chin was like a gun barrel. You know? It was a 45 caliber dimple. I was hev heavily influenced by him, and then a few weeks later, I saw The Wild One with Marlon Brando, oh, yeah. and I became Marlon Brando. Uh -huh. He had a way of leaning against things. I would come out of the cinema and lean against things. For a month, I leant against everything. <laughs> Until I leant against a bus, and it moved off. <laughs> but I, I developed a Marlon Brando mumble, even with my mother. <laughs> Say, what's that, darling? <laughs> Speak up, darling, I can't understand a word. 
Mummy, can I have some money? <laughs> Like that. But what, what, what is it that we were looking for, you see? I mean, was it fame? Was it wealth? Was it the chance to marry Hedda Lamar or Eva Gardner? Well, those three things you just named are exactly the things Freud did say women were after. <laughs> fame, he said, men do what they do for fame, for wealth and the love of women. And it's still the best answer I've ever heard. Yes. Yeah, you're after all those things. You don't necessarily get them, but I'm still hoping, you know, and the Hollywood call might come. I could, be, I could be a gladiator, one yeah. of the ones who gets chopped off at the knees in the first... <laughs> And then Russell Crowe takes it. Russell Crowe, how? I can't believe this, you know. And the Aussies have finally really made it on the world stage. I mean, Paul Hogan threw a prawn on the Barbie and got famous. But Russell Crowe has wiped out about 150 gladiators and special effects, and he's really the Australian now. But he's got something, hasn't he, that, that, uh, <coughs> that Kirk Douglas has got as well, that raw power, intensity. that intensity, yes. which, I mean, burns through the screen at you, doesn't yeah. it? It's, it's very, it's very compelling. Yeah, it sure is, and, and the rest of us are supposed to spend our life avoiding that, but it, it seems to be what re women require. Mm, yeah. Well, what about, I mean, you, you just later returned from, from home, from, from Australia. Yes, I was there uh, only two days ago, actually. But and before that, you were there for the Olympics. I was there Olympics. for the Olympics, which was simply amazing everything you heard is true and uh, i think australia became aware of itself as the promised land at yes. last of course the whole world the joke is the whole world was already aware of australia as the promised <laughs> land australia was so nervous about it, itself you know will we make it will, will we succeed in staging the games well they did in a big way and now australia is the, the new danger i think is australia will become a overconfident huge imperial power so we'll, <laughs> we, we, we'll have to cut it down to size but yeah. It was a tr tremendous and triumphant moment, and it was a lot of fun, too. There was a party in the streets every day, and the games themselves weren't, weren't bad. Uh, you know, even, even the events were watchable, especially the women's volleyball, which was the biggest hit in Australia, and I understand. You were, you were taken by that, were you? Taken by it. I was taken by it, thrown around. I mean, I, I watched every... It's really not much of a game, women's volleyball. No. You know, she, she pats it to her, and she pats it to her, and then they pat it over the net. You know. It's the way they look and what they wear, Michael. <laughs> now, the Australian winning team was gorgeous enough, but the Brazilians, the ones who lost, you see the Brazilians? It's the sort of the caramel tanned goddesses with these tiny, tiny costumes with a little thong at the back, separating these two honey-coloured globes, jost <laughs> jostling for position. You know? And th these women weren't going to run the risk of overdeveloping their upper arms by any athletic manoeuvres. They just touched the ball like that. <laughs> But the, yeah, but the uh, Australian cameramen, usually men, uh, Australia being a very feminist country, they had to have a good excuse for, for zooming in for the butt shot. You know? <laughs> but they had it because these girls would make signals behind their butts. Ah, yeah. right. See, one finger meant hit it to her, and the other finger meant hit it to me, and three fingers hooked into the thong meant my costume was disappearing up my butt. <laughs> <laughs> and we watched in fascination. Oh, Women's volleyball could be huge. Oh, yeah, it could but, be. But not here. The, no, not, not no here. No beach. On Cleethorpe, <laughs> sounds it would be a, a bit different. Wouldn't right. it? I mean, I'd be wearing those costumes that you, that you described. <laughs> but what you mentioned there, Australia is a feminist country. It is. It's a very strongly feminist country. What did, did attitudes change with this influx of, of virile men from other cultures? Yes, they did. The Australian women are used to not being looked at in the street by Australian men. Because, of course, uh, Australian men have, uh, have learned their lesson. People like Jermaine Greer have laid the lesson down and it has been taken in and men do not treat women as sex objects. But just on the slim possibility that women still do want to be treated as sex objects, these visiting athletes were a big hit. And the Australian women were, for the first time in years, were being looked at in the street, <laughs> stared at, talked to, and they weren't sure that they liked it. On the other hand, they weren't sure that they didn't like it. Because <laughs> your average Australian male swimming hero away from the pool is no model of sophistication. No. You know? But your average Italian swimming hero, if the world, could be a model for Armani. You know? And these guys would take the girls out to lunch and they would listen to what they said and say, that's an interesting book you're reading, and stroke their wrist. And, they was, and, and there was a big hit. And, uh, and uh, the Australian women liked these, these visiting male athletes. And what's more, the visiting athletes liked Australia. Do you realise, this is a little known statistic, I've only seen this once mentioned in a newspaper and then not followed up. This is the first time on, on television with this information. I'm of all the visiting foreign athletes to Australia for the Olympics, 130 are still missing. <laughs> and 30 of those are British. They've just gone bush. They're gone. 
and Australian intelligence or the visa system, whatever, is looking for them. <laughs> and they've offered them an amnesty. If they give themselves up, they'll merely be deported from the country instead of jailed. <laughs> but they, they've seen Australia and they love it. And oh, they're right. Of course, it, it is the promised it, land. It, of course it is. Now, in a word, we haven't seen you. Let's get up to date with you. Because apart from this, uh, what, what you've well, been doing for the past year is getting slim. Yeah, and I, I've been off screen. Uh, I've been off screen for a year. Well, more than a year. I'm working on a big internet project, which I'm hoping to launch uh, in May, which is a bit early to talk about it. But I'm going to try and do a web casting, I do a show down the internet. I don't think anyone's really done it yet. What kind of show? And I'm, well, it's going to be sort of talking, and uh, I'm not so sure it can be done. Technically, it's quite tricky, but if we can do that, it'll be very, very fascinating. And I'll, more about that when the time comes, but I'm also writing books, which I haven't been able to sit down and do for a while. And generally, I'm recovering, uh, because I had a tough experience the year before last. Uh, I really shouldn't talk about it because of legal problems, I suppose, but I, I, I interviewed Barbara Streisand, and it was so tough that I, I went into shock. You were. And, uh, <laughs> I was on an insulin drip for the next six months. <laughs> the, interview, the interview wasn't so bad, it was the waiting. She kept me waiting five hours, and, and I was already getting old, and in those five hours, <laughs> I got older, and there's, there was something else on top of that which I hadn't told anyone. Go on. You promise you won't tell anyone? No. After five hours, I had to pee. <laughs> and I couldn't, because I was standing there in the set waiting for it to come on. And so we started the interview, and I was tough. I really, I pushed her hard. I said, you know, you are a genius. And she reluctantly agreed, you know. It was, <laughs> it was going, but three quarters of the way through the interview, I said, put my hand up, I said, can I have, go to the bathroom? <laughs> and this was the first time for years that anyone in her presence had even betrayed the desire to sneeze, let, let alone urinate, you know. <laughs> And uh, I went off and, did, and I came back and, uh, and the interview picked up again, but I, I, I really, I didn't dare to take the piss out of her. But, uh, <laughs> it, but was it turned a, out she took the piss out of me, right? A, <laughs> it was a defining moment, though. <laughs> it was, it was one of those moments where you say, can I go on like this, you know, because yeah. the, the stars are getting tougher and... Uh, well, maybe are they getting a, tougher? It's, is it the, the people it's surround people around them. Around yeah. them. Well, well and, and in a way they're right, because uh, you have... A star has to protect himself or herself against the hard questions and, and, and being embarrassed. And that's what the people around them do. But it makes it so tough to get at them that it eventually becomes extremely hard work, I think. But is there also something, perhaps, in this country, as well, can I talk about this country, that the stars are, generally speaking, you, you can sympathise with them avoiding uh, the, the confrontation with the media because the media's changed. The yeah. attitude of the media has changed toward these people. It has, and the press has become uh, very, very hard to shake off. And I suppose you could say that you get into this business because you want to be famous and then you have to live with the results. I know I did. I mean, there's no question of it. I, was, I wanted, to be, uh, wanted to be famous when I was in school. I was always the most famous schoolboy in the class. And <laughs> I shouldn't really say why, you know. I, I said it, no, no, but why? I said it in my book, Unreliable Memoirs, which we launched on this show 20 we, years ago. 20 years ago, we did. And it's coming out again at the end of this year. You know, well, so it should. It's yeah. a classic book. But I, the things I'm saying tonight, well... I was famous for farting in class. <laughs> I, all, all, the time. Well, all the guys did it, but I was the only one who could do it on cue. Yeah. <laughs> I was in show business, right? And that, and that gave me a taste, as it were, of what fame could be like. And it goes on from there, but then the day comes when you say, hey, this is more awkward than I thought. And then you can't get it back. And I'm not so sure you should be able to get it back. But yeah. uh, a, a, an intrusive press is a product of a free society. If you like a free society, sure. an intrusive press comes with it. Sure. And that's it. But what to do about it is a, is a hard question. Well, it is a hard question, yeah, of, of course it is. And one doesn't want to say the press Muslim, but we, you know, we can talk about this because we're both journalists. Well, the, we, we, we work both sides of the street. The press goes nuts, and, uh, and when we're in the press, we go nuts too. I mean, everyone wants to talk about Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. The, bro the, the, the tabloids talk about Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. They go berserk about Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman. Then the, then the broadsheets talk about what the tabloids say about Tom and Nicole. Then the magazines talk about what the broadsheets said. And it builds up and up and up, and now we're talking about it. And the truth is, we don't know what's happened. That's right. And you're never going to know, because it's two people. It's a secret. <laughs> and, uh, well, there's an entire industry built yeah. on the supposition, sources close yeah. to reveal that and all that yeah. sort of nonsense. I've got my own ideas. I think uh, my own guess, yes. <laughs> my own guess is that it, she's too tall for him. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's, a, he's a tiny guy, and, you know, and, the, and the truth finally dawned. You know? <laughs> she was crouching there beside him at some premiere, and she thought, I can't go on like this. <laughs> you think that might be it? You might have to have a knee yeah. replacement. Yeah. Yeah. His yeah. people will be after me now. The Scientologists <laughs> will be after me. <laughs> now, what about our next guest, given your love of, of movies? Miss Goldie, well, I've been in love 
with us since day one. I lit a cigarette earlier on. Yeah. Yeah. I, I saw, it, was it was just touching one, a wonderful moment. Yeah, it was. And uh, I was crazy about it since the first episode of The La Laugh-In. And, uh, you know, she used to play this wonderful ditzy go-go dancer yeah. who got the lines wrong. You could tell by the way she got the lines wrong that she knew exactly how to get them right. <laughs> and there was this wonderful running gag based on sock it to me. Every time she said sock it to me, she got a bucket of water or a bucket of confetti in the face. And the lovely thing was that they all tried to trick her into saying sock it to me. And she got, she said sock it to me even by accident. You know, she'd say, it may be Japanese rice wine to you, but it's sake to me. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought it was so witty and so funny and she was so wonderful. And I wasn't at all surprised at she went on to become a big screen star, but what did impress me, and I must say it impresses me about Barbara Streisand too, for all I say about it, is that these women took power in Hollywood. They did what totally. the men did, yeah? Yeah. started controlling their own careers, yeah. and Hollywood has become better for it. Yeah. It was a big, big breakthrough, and she's part of it, and here she comes. We'll talk about it. Mm. Clive James. Well, as, as Clive said, my next guest did become a television star as the dizzy blonde in the laughing. Then she conquered Hollywood, not simply as an actress who was both sexy and funny, but as a producer and a filmmaker. Ladies and gentlemen, Goldie Horn. <laughs> So. Really smart. I uh -uh. just, I mean, let Luda could listen to you, you know, talk. Yeah. You want to be treated rough? Uh, <laughs> uh, I do. <laughs> I'm your man. <laughs> yes, what, Those Australians are tough. What do women want? I mean, that's the question he posed, you see. Uh, you know, let's ask a woman. What? It's so interesting, that, that question, because we don't really, we don't really know. I mean, we could say one day we feel we want that tough guy, and then the next day you can say, well, I don't really feel like that tough guy right now. I want that really sensitive guy. I want him to feel like soft and cushy. I so can be what, soft and cushy. I can be soft and cushy. You, <laughs> it, it's an odd thing, but women want lots of things. I don't think one man can serve a woman completely with all that she needs. Mm. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> well, that lets us out then try and uh, <laughs> try to, man. Speak, speak for yourself old boy <laughs> serve completely i like the sound of that i mean if we could actually find all the personalities inside of us file them and hone them yeah, yeah. and own them then think of all the people we could be for our mates yeah because i really do i mean you know so russell crowe is rough and tough you know yeah. I, you get tired of that yeah. I mean, I think he's a cool guy, and I like him. Yeah. But, you know, and Kurt is a perfect example. Kurt Russell. Yeah, you're. because Kurt is the t a tough, what he looks like, you know, a tough mm. guy. Very strong. He's got very strong opinions. Um, there's not a lot of gray area. I like that. I like that with him. There's never a dull moment. But he's also incredibly warm. He's very surprising. I don't always know what he's going to say. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So I don't even know when he's going to cry. I mean, sometimes he'll cry, and I go, <laughs> so it, it's not all one thing. Okay. Well, that's, no, that's good. I mean, that's, well, that just makes it harder. You, what, you, it does, well, come on, confusing. guys. You've got to work at this. Yeah. <laughs> it isn't that simple. I mean, when women, when men, you know, have a relationship, and we're obviously we're talking about relationships, aren't we? Right. Yeah. So don't men just sort of want um, their wife, lovely, mm. lovely wife, mm. and then desire something else? It's what happens. So there, the, all this conversation, we could do a whole show on this. <laughs> but how do we, how do we, uh, what is the word, um, integrate all of our needs so each, all of us can stay happy and stay together? Polygamy is the answer. Yeah. Polygamy yeah. is, uh, exactly. exactly. Yeah. Well, what about, I mean, talking about relationships with Kurt, I mean, one thing about you, you've been together 17 years and never got 18. married. 18. 18 years. We just had an anniversary. 18 years and n never got married. My bangs need cut. <laughs> is that a way of avoiding the question? No, but look! I have to cut them before the bath door. You do. 
Uh, uh, okay, so what, so 18 years, we just had our anniversary on Valentine's Day. And what's the question? The question is, why did you never get married and are you going to get married? Well, I've been married. I know, twice before. Right. Mm -hmm. So that didn't work. So I figured, <laughs> why not try something different? Mm -hmm. And let's not own each other. Let's not have any one country, state, city decide yeah. what the rules are. Um, God is inside of us, all around us, so I consider myself blessed, and we're blessed every day. I wake up every morning with the choice to be where I am. There's no law or lawyer that's going to be able to tell me what I need to feel and what I don't need to feel, or minister, or rabbi. So I've decided that I like that way of life. But you can do this because you're a powerful woman, can't you? Uh, yes, because I do have a sense of self and of place, and I have the power of my convictions, and, and, can, and I like myself. And you, and, and you have <clears> the economic <throat> strength, so you can tell That's anyone to go to hell, which is very and important. Exactly. Yeah. And I do have economic um, independence, well, which I think is a big issue. Oh, of course it is. But, I, I mean, going back, I mean, you, you are this, this uh, rare bird. You're this, this person in Hollywood, this woman in Hollywood who is powerful. But going back to, to what Clive was saying about him wanting to be famous from a very early age, mm -hmm. is that what you want to be, to be famous? No, I did not want to be no? famous. <clears throat> I was completely a realist. I think it was my father's, you know, gift to me, is that to be real, to live a real life was what was important. Not to have pipe dreams or dream that something's going to happen to you or that you could actually become a star. <clears throat> I, my dream was to be a dancer. And when I went out to L.A., I went out because I was dancing. And then I did that gig, and then I got another gig, and I went to Las Vegas, and I danced in Las Vegas for three months. And then I hated Vegas, and I decided to maybe go on the road with these guys, and I called my dad, who was a musician, and he said, you know, go, I did bus, I trucked all over the place in clubs. It's not a good life. <clears throat> I wouldn't do it. And I said, okay, so what I'll do is I'll go back to L.A., I'll give myself nine months, I'll see if I can get on a TV show dancing, and if not, I'll come back and I'll open a dancing school. Because I always looked ahead at what I was going to do. It was an industrial mentality, right? So I gave myself that time period, and lo and behold, I did that television show, and an agent saw me, signed me to the William Morris Agency, and in two weeks later, I had a role written in for me in this part, in a television series that was... Which made your star. Which is what started my career. But, but I mean, a lot of people, that would have happened to quite a few people, but, but they did not have the career that you've had, because what you did then was that you turned that on its head. I mean, then you're the dizzy blonde, and right. you're girl in town, right? Right. And that's a fairly slender premise to go to Hollywood Absolutely. on. Absolutely. But, but you I mean, turned that, that, that round and became something far more substantial. You know, what? the one question that I was asked when I was young, when I was on laugh -in, was all the women at that time, you see, were burning their bras. I mean, this is the time that women's liberation was really happening, right? Mm -hmm. And Greer and this one and that one, and they were all talking about, you know. And I was just enjoying, I mean, I was 21 years old, give me a break, you know. And I was just enjoying, you know, being who I was. I was successful, I had a job, I got married, I cooked dinner, I had like a great life. And they'd say to me, don't you feel that it's irresponsible to be doing what you're doing at this time in history when women are actually declaring their independence and it's women's liberation. And I remember at the age of 21, I looked up at, at them and I said, you know, I don't understand that because I already feel liberated. So in that is the liberation really is inside. Mm. I must say, as a red-blooded Russell Crowe type Australian male, mm. it was a great moment when the bras burned, you know. <laughs> Because I'd never now known, they burn the bottoms. I'd never known how to get them off. <laughs> <laughs> that I is a problem. Always one more hook. I totally mm -hmm. ruined your joke. <laughs> no, you didn't. I went you, right in the time. No, you didn't. No, you, <laughs> gave, you gave it a little, like, little extra seconds of pause. that gave it that extra tan. Okay. <laughs> but I mean, you, you tell me the last time that we, that we met about that dancing. I mean, you made it sound like you know it's like chorus line, but it wasn't it. I mean, you had some awful gigs, didn't you? I mean, oh, you worked horrible. at go-go clubs. Yeah. And, you were in a cage and men sort of... Yes, it wasn't... Um, let's put it this way. Um, for a young girl in New York at that time, when doing what I was doing, I was had so many, I, what, what is it, propositions and, and not very nice things. It's a wonder that I came out really loving uh, you. Good to ask you, that's yeah. right. Um, because they weren't very nice, and, and you are an object. And, and I took responsibility for that, which is you know, part of the deal. Uh, one finger out, three fingers back to you, right? So, 
I was up there dancing with skimpy little outfits, with little things, and I was shaking my booty, and I was doing all this. Well, what do you expect? I mean, yeah. that's the whole thing. So you have to know that if you're going to take that position, then, and you're not in the ballet corps de ballet, which is what I didn't do, then you have to suffer the consequences. I also read, <clears> too, <throat> that, that I mean, you went through the casting couch syndrome, too. I mean, Al Cap, I think, uh, auditioned you in a rather... Um, yeah, that I had that. Uh, poor Al Cap, God rest his soul. I'm sure he's doing his duty now. He was a man, by the way. <laughs> well, he did the Labner. Little Labner commentary. Yeah. Yes, he was an interesting political cartoonist, which I thought was very interesting. He was very right wing. He was extremely right wing. Yeah, and, 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 and had, had some. He was good at that. He made, created these great characters. Yeah. However, he, poor guy, didn't have a leg. <laughs> didn't have. He was deficient in the leg department. He didn't have a he didn't have a leg. So what he did was is he he I had me doing all this you know dan not dancing but I was reading and I thought I was like going to have like David Merrick's people um, going to give me a job they were going to work with me to help train me you know and I was dancing at the World's Fair at the time doing the can can over a bar so I was like I was so successful in my own <laughs> eyes in my own mind right. So anyway, I had to pour his tea and do all this stuff. So I was de walking around. He said, now, I want you to walk over there. And because I like to see your legs because um, you could be Daisy May. And suddenly I looked at my legs. I looked at my breasts. And I was just, I'm not even Daisy May because she had these big tits. That's right. That's right. You know, everything was like, broop, broop. And I'm looking flat as a pancake, you know. <laughs> Felt weird. And then he said, put the, pull your things up. So I pulled in those days. It wasn't so many, you know. So I pulled it up to a mini height. There, actually, it was getting there, but I was more conservative. So <coughs> anyway, I walked over, and he had pulled that leg up. I'm sorry to be disgusting, but you know, it's late <laughs> night television. <laughs> Is he took the um, wooden leg and lifted it up on the couch. It was so awful. And he had this like robe on, which was already suspect, you know. <laughs> And he leaned back, and I gasped. I swear to God, it was like. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Cap, I said, I will never get a job like this. He said, well, you'll never go anywhere in this business. Go back and marry a Jewish dentist like your mother said for you to do, which is what I shared with him in the beginning of our sweet chat. And, uh, I said, well, then I will, then I will, I will go back and marry a Jewish dentist. And I have to go to the World's Fair now. And now I have to take a cab because I'm late. And he threw $20 at me. And he said, you'll never get anywhere in this business. <laughs> wrong. Yeah, wrong. I had wrong, the last yeah. laugh. Yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely, you did. So they, that was that story. Well, no, no, but what's interesting, now you must look at your daughter now, Kate Hudson. Yes. Who I saw in Almost Famous. Who's wonderful. Yes, I mean, she's, she's wonderful. She's got a big career ahead of her. I know. And, and so that going, having gone through all that you had to go through, yeah. in a sense, to, 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 to make it to where you are, you must have felt, well, how did you feel when she said she wanted to be an actress? Oh, fine. You I did. mean, Katie is, she came out. I mean, you know with your children. I mean, yeah. she didn't come out saying, I want to read Proust. She came out saying, da 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 da, <laughs> mommy, <laughs> I'm here. Do you know? I mean, her entrance into the room was always a main event. Right. Kate was always. A, no, the key to, I think, having healthy children, whatever they want to do, is that, particularly in the, in the, in the industry, if yeah. that's what you yeah, want to do, sure. is to make sure that they stay in school, they do their work, that they get their work done, and that after they graduate high school, I, I wanted college for Kate, but she said she wanted to start her career, but high school, uh, then they can go out. And she said, I want to try it for a year, Mom. I said, now you can go. Now you can get your agent and do all that stuff, but not before. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it worked out very well. Yeah. She's a fantastic person. Yeah, she's, she's a good, good actress and obviously got a, a, a great career. But you, so you're not frightened of that being replicated, that, all that, that sort of uh, tough time that oh, you Oh, she'll had. have tough times. Yeah. Absolutely. Is, is it different Hollywood now? I, I wouldn't like life things? without them, and I, I think that it would be terrible if she didn't have tough times. But, but, but is it different Hollywood, the Hollywood she's going to than the one that you, you went to? The Hollywood is very different. Is it different for women? Is it better for women? Uh, for women? It's, in some ways, it's better for women. 
women. I think that we've come a bit of a way. I really do. Um, well, it's got a lot to do with people like you and, and, and indeed Barbara Streisand. But to do that, you had to assume power, which means you had to contradict men, put them in their place, and fight the battle. Yeah, it, it wasn't easy. It, mm. it, it really wasn't easy. And, and a lot of times it was what you'd call a double-edged sword. So if in, the, in those ways for my daughter, I hope that I was a trailblazer for the girls, for the young girls. I know they all have their own production companies now. And, uh, you know, um, uh, what's her name? Uh, um, Drew Barrymore has yeah. hers. And Julia. And all these people are having, and they're producing their own things, and they're getting involved in their own careers. They are taking control. Kate Hudson is definitely her mother's daughter. She is very smart. She is uh, entrepreneurial by nature. She knows when things work and when they don't work. And she doesn't mince words, which is very important. But the double-edged sword is, is that the good news is, 1981, Goldie did Private Benjamin. It was a big smash hit. You I produced also it. produced it. Yes, now, uh, it was a big deal, right? I was on the cover of Newsweek. It was all great. And we would think that this was a real cause for celebration. However, what happened was a backlash. Because then I became a person who wanted to control everything I did. This was the perception. This was not the mm -hmm. truth. The perception was is that I was being controlling, that uh, directors maybe didn't want to work with me, that suddenly I became kind of a one-man band. So it, on the other hand, I at some points wish that it never happened because I would just then be able to be an actress yes. for hire. But I wasn't perceived that way. Yes. I mean, even directors would try to get out of my contract some of the things that I had won over the years yes. of approvals and, and things like that. So it was a very, very, you know, again, Happy, sad, happy, sad, you yes. know? But if you, if you were just an actress for hire, you'd never get offered something as interesting as swing shift. You have to create something like that, don't you? Or you like that? Uh, you, you do create things like that, absolutely. You find them what? and you create them. But I'll tell you something interesting now, what we're doing, and it's very exciting, is that Oliver, who is also an actor, who is now doing a television That's your series. Son. It's my 24-year-old. Kate, who's off and running, Kurt and myself, have created a company called Cosmic Entertainment. And this is a multimedia company. So Kate will be producing under Cosmic, her company. I am producing under my company. Oliver is producing under his company. And Kurt is producing under his company. And what we're doing is we're bringing in all these wonderful young talent. And we're doing television series and movies for television. And uh, it films themselves and uh, documentaries that I've been wanting to do for years on joy and things that matter to me. So it's our way of staying together as a family because we're, we're incredibly close and loving. We love to be together. And now we're working together. You've got a dynasty building like, like Kurt Douglas's in a sense. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah. I, it, it's true. I mean, if your family loves to be together, and we do, and if we go on vacation and all we really want to be is together, uh. then in life, as we go on, what do we do with the rest of our lives? Well, the kids want to do this, and Kurt and I want to be with them. So however we can nurture this process along, you know, we're going to do it. So it's very, very exciting. Well, Got any room for any <clears throat> old, undiscovered We talent? do. <laughs> we do. We do. We... Listen, the Internet is a fabulous place. Yeah. Right. There's room for everybody on that. Well, yeah. on, on my new Internet <clears throat> channel, there's certainly room for your dynasty. But I was thinking, <laughs> I think in one of your movies, a sort of old, uh, undiscovered Australian <clears throat> macho actor. Yeah, you know what? You yeah, never know. Skirt. Very yeah. leather skirt. Yeah. Yeah. And sandals. Yeah. Yeah. And a wooden sword. That's so funny. <laughs> Goldie Hall for the moment. Thank you very much indeed. You Goldie bet. Hall. Coming up in just a moment, Kirk Douglas. But it's time now for a song from a singer who started a career right here in the 80s and then became an international star. A new album is called Lovers Rock. From it, King of Sorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Sade.
My final guest tonight is a Hollywood legend. His career has lasted over 50 years and more than 80 movies. He's one of the great stars and one of the great survivors. In recent years, he's overcome a near-fatal helicopter crash and a stroke. He's head of the most dynamic family dynasty in Hollywood. Welcome, please, Kirk Douglas. <laughs> Just flown in from Berlin, where you got the Golden Bear Award, Special Lifetime Achievement Award. Since last we met, they've been throwing awards at you, the Special mm -hmm. Academy Award. Listen, Michael, if you live long enough, you get all the awards. <laughs> <laughs> That's the trick of it. <laughs> achievement award makes me mad. Yeah. I mean, is it over? I mean, <laughs> lifetime achievement. Exactly. I, I did a picture last year, no, the first picture after, after my stroke. I know. So I want to be the most popular actor in the world with a stroke. <laughs> <laughs> How do you... I mean, you were, what, 78, 79 when you had the stroke? Yes, well... A lot of people, I think, at that age would, would kind it, of... It was three years ago. Well, then it's, you're 80. I'm, I'm, I'm 84. 84. And, well, and count it. And count it. <laughs> Eight, 84 and still here, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, I mean, a lot of people, I would have imagined, would not have survived it mentally, in, the, in a sense. They would have rolled over and said, well, this is it. But you didn't do that. You know, I have learned so much from my helicopter crash, then from my stroke. Because first of all, you learn that things can always be worse. <laughs> I'm <Okay>. here. <laughs> I don't speak as well as, as I used to, but my wife said that there's too much talking anyway. <laughs> <laughs> no. And I have, look, I, 
I'm just finishing a book. I call the book My Stroke of Luck. And in it, I try to maybe help other people with handicaps. For example, depression. I know depression, there's lots of scientific causes of it. But I think one of the big causes of depression is narcissism. Mm -hmm. You are thinking too much of the body yourself. Mm -hmm. You have to start thinking about other people and other things, and you get, and that's the way I got out of my, my, my depression. So when it first happened to you, you were depressed. You thought, why me? Uh, God, why me? And uh, what am I going to do now? Well, what is an actor who can't talk? You know, and at the beginning, I couldn't talk at all. Then, then I started to study with a speech therapist, and Michael, we were, Michael and I were always going to do a movie together. So Michael said, well, Dad, you keep working with your speech therapist, and then we'll do the movie. I got mad and said, Michael, why don't you work with my speech therapist? <laughs> And then I said, and then, Michael, when you talk the way I talk, we'll do the movie. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, it's, the basic fact is that you had to learn how to speak again. Yes, yes. You know, when you think of it, we talk, all you people, you, you talk. You think of something and you say it, and you never think what is required to, I had to learn to make every sound. Yes. And, you know, but the frustrating thing is my thoughts are here, but my speech is crawling around. So it gets frustrating. Yes. But you understand me? I can understand you perfectly well. You understand well, me? Of course. <laughs> Listen, Michael, I love this girl. <laughs> I would marry her if my wife would let me. <laughs> now, she is a famous actress, the mother of an almost famous daughter. Yes, so Katie, right. I think, will win the, the award. Will win the, yes. the, the, the Academy Award? Yes. But, I mean, well, you, you've got much, much in common. Famous, uh, well, almost famous, famous no. sons. Uh, yeah, I mean, no, you've got no, a... I have a famous son who has an almost famous father. father. <laughs> <laughs> and I will say that I have a famous daughter yeah. who has an almost famous mother. <laughs> there you are. Right. We're so, we're so <laughs> mothers. <Yeah. laughs> Did you ever imagine that, that, that Michael would become this, this great Hollywood star that he's become and producer Michael, too? he never had any interest in dramatics. When he went to college, he suddenly said, Dad, I'm going to be in, in a play. Are you in a play? Okay, I went up to see it. It was a Shakespearean play, and they, you know, arm uh, akimbo. That was expensive, arm akimbo, uh, you know. And he had those sights on. He had a very small part. And after it was over, he said, well, Dad, how was that? I said, Michael, you were awful. <laughs> I said, oh, 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 oh. I said, I don't know what you were saying. And I thought, well, okay, he's going to be a lawyer. This would be it. Two months later, he said, I'm going to be in a play. Okay. I went to see it. After the play, he said, how was it? I said, Michael, you were very, very good. And Michael, he has been very good. Every time since then, I think. Mm -hmm. I think. Oh, I agree. So, Silica, you're very proud of him, obviously. Yes, because I think he's a, a, a great actor. He was, uh, there are pictures that wasn't seen so so often. Wonderboard. He was oh, yeah. very oh, good. Good movie. Yeah. And then he had, and he also this year 
It was a movie, Traffic, mm. with a wonderful, wonderful movie. You and went to the wedding, didn't you? Mm-hmm, I did. Do you know the only people who didn't go to your wedding is me and Clive? <laughs> <laughs> That's not true. You should have invited him. I was insulted. Yeah. Listen, I was at the wedding. I didn't see Goldie. <laughs> so many... I know, it's true. I saw did you, you dancing, though. I was jealous. Did you enjoy the wedding? It, it, it was a fairy story, but I will tell you something. If I live two more years, I will be married for 50 years. 50. And I decided to have a wedding. Oh, Almost great. as big, because when I was married, we were rushed. I was doing 20,000 leagues under the sea, and then we rushed Saturday to Las Vegas, and we were married by a guy called Honest Don Lytell. I think he was a phony. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe, maybe, I'm not, maybe I'm not even married. <laughs> so, and I have two, two sons for, for uh, grandsons. But this time, of course, if my wife says yes, I will propose to her. Yeah. If she says yes, I will have a big wedding. Uh-huh. You'll be with I'm, I'm I'm too fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's very romantic. That's wonderfully romantic. Oh, I what love What about, well, mm. again, the question I asked, I asked Goldie, I mean, you've been a Hollywood star now for 50 years. The changes that you've seen are extraordinary. Is it a, a better place now than it was? I think, you know, things go up and, up and down. There's a lot of talented young people but I think they, ha I hope they concentrate more on the story. Yes. I said to Arnold Schwarzenegger one night, it's these Arnold, when you get a car, you, you give a thousand bullets. When I was in Watson, I killed a guy with only one bullet. <laughs> <laughs> It's a waste of time. It's so perfect. You also said once, which I found a very interesting quote from you. You said that, that even though you came from the, the, the background that you did, that, that you thought that, you, that Michael was more disadvantaged than you were. Of course. But, but how so? I, I, Goldie would know what I mean. I was very poor. Didn't have enough to do it. So I had nowhere to go but up. I mean, I was always ready down. That's right. But my uh, son, they, they know they're always going to be enough to eat. Right. They know they're always enough my money for college. So that's a disadvantage. They have to overcome that. I, I was going to add to that in terms of, of, of Kate and Oliver and so forth, is that they look at me remembering, and I tell them my stories of how I struggled and how I danced on tables and how I met all these crazy people, and how I didn't have any money and how I gave my last dime to a, you know, to a cab driver for a tip, and I was crying because I couldn't give him more. And Katie looked at me and she said, and Oliver both, and they said, we'll never know what that's like. Yes. I wish I could have those <laughs> stories, and I don't know if I'll be able to ever have stories But like you this. see, it, it, it's an enriching experience, but you have to be tough to survive it. That's the point. You know, I mean, a lot of people could go under. A lot of people were like you, came from the background you did, and didn't make it like you did, and similarly with you. So there's something, you know, there's a strong gene there. There's something well, that's... but you have a chance. In yeah. my country, in England too, you have a chance. You believe that? My that's mother and father didn't, uh, didn't make that journey from Russia. Where would I be? Yes. Right. Because you have a chance. Well, when you think of the leap of faith that they took, your parents. Exactly. Coming, yeah, not exactly. being able to speak the language yeah. to a foreign country, that's an extraordinary. Can, can we just go back uh, on, this, on this speech therapy that you, that, that you have? Do, do you have to do it all the time? Do you have to work with a speech therapist? I now? work, now I work once a week. But I have to exercise. Mm. You know, I did my first movie, after my stroke, I played a man with a stroke, obviously. You played a boxer, didn't you? And it was, he was, used to be a, used boxer, to be a boxer, and then they, were, they uh, used some film from Champion. But in that movie, I did I, all the exercises that I, I, I do every, every day. Right. Uh, oh, you have to get the, the lips going, the tongue going, 
how the teeth, and then I, 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 I say like A E I O U, baby, bye, boo, boo. Being pretty yeah, good, huh? That sounds damn good. That sounds damn good. <laughs> so anyhow, Baby you, have a, uh, you have to exercise every day. What well, well, there particular words? Have there been particular words that have really frustrated you? Listen, what is it? Spaghetti. <laughs> I couldn't, and I love spaghetti. <laughs> I went to a restaurant, I was like, well, S, I had uh, lots of trouble with S's. So I said, I, I will have, I will have spaghetti. Spaghetti. They, we laughed because I always make fun of myself. So I was with a group. The next week I, I worked at my S's. And that group, the same ones so I came in, they were on another table and I went over to the table and I said, spaghetti, <laughs> spaghetti, <laughs> spaghetti. <laughs> I got, finally got it. Yeah, they must have a wonderful sense of triumph. I mean, everything's mm -hmm. like yes. that become, a, become momentous, don't yes. they, in a, in a sense. See, you <laughs> as, then it, so you could, spaghetti. Mm. Really, you don't think about it. As a matter of fact, I found it. I find it fascinating. No, you think, my God, the, we don't realize what the human body is, how, how a thought is transferred into speech. Yes. What what is the is the main message in the book then that you've written about about your about the, the stroke? What, what, I try to say. To people, one never give up, never. See, but I said because at first never give up. Two sense of humor. Sensible. Laugh at yourself. Laugh at other people. If when I when I said to something and my kids would say, what that what did you say? I say. Don't you speak English? <laughs> <laughs> you don't like that. And then they all laugh. Then I, I feel, uh, quote, as I say, depression. Try to think of other people. You know, try to do something for other people. And if you, in a little bit of religion comes into it. Because I breathe in prayer. Yes. Because if you analyze all the religion, the base of it is do unto others as you would like them to do unto you. In other words, be, be good people. The last millennium, my generation did a terrible job. Look, it was all kinds of awful things, including McCarthy and I visited the Holocaust, all the world. So it's up to you young people. So my wife and I do many things for my wife, especially to help young people. My wife, has, uh, she read the deplorable the state of the, of, the, of the playground in the school. So, he, so we got some money together and she, she fixed 100 playgrounds and you're going to do 300 more. So I said, honey, I'm so proud of you. What can I do to help? Help? She said, no, make another movie. We need the money. <laughs> but, but, but that's, well, that's the final question. I mean, are you going to make another movie? <laughs> well, uh, yes. Of course. You are? Of course. Well, <laughs> I'm an actor. You are an actor. You are I'm an actor. actor. Listen, but I, I would like to do something on your show, do we have time? I want to, I want to sing a song. Uh, but I know what you're going to You sang it before my show, you know, a long time ago. That's right. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. Exactly. Do you want to sing it? Well, they, they do. They uh, want it. They, yeah. 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 I sang this song 30 years ago. You did? And this is a song, a, 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 a song, song, spaghetti, spaghetti. 
did the song that I did with Burt Lancaster at the Palladium. We said, I'll do it. Now, I wanted to sing here because the last thing when I left the hotel, my wife said, and don't sing. <laughs> <laughs> so she, well, she wanted the show. I said, well, why not? She said, you don't have a good voice. <laughs> well, I said, you have a good voice with nothing to do with it. But if you don't have a good voice and you can still sing, that's nothing. I will show you. <laughs> London isn't everybody's cup of tea. This is your America's cup line. But I'm here to tell you that I disagree because I was yen for singing the land. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner. Now I love London so. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I think of her wherever I go. I get a funny feeling inside of me, just walking up and down. Maybe it's because I'm a Londoner that I love London town. Yeah, bravo. Bravo. Oh, my God. Come home, my wife will be. You are wife. in the doghouse. I was you, yeah. <laughs> you were terrible. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were, as Clive and I were saying earlier, I mean, people like you, and you particularly, were an inspiration to us many years ago, 50 years ago, as a film star. I think you're a bigger inspiration now to, to, to the world at large. Thank Kurt you. Douglas, thank you. Thank you. Thanks to Kirk Douglas, to Goldie Horn, Clive James and Shardy. Next week, my guests are Ardell Hanlon, Amanda Donoghue, Esther Ranson and Lionel Richie. From all of us here, a very good night. Good night. <laughs>